Soil is a vital living ecosystem that supports plants, animals, and humans. It's teeming with billions of bacteria, fungi, and other microbes that are the foundation of a complex ecosystem. Viewing soil this way reflects a fundamental shift in the way we care for it. Welcome to the Soil Health Podcast from Minokin Farms. Good morning, this is uh, Jay Fear at the Minokin Farm, and we're getting ready for um, for one of our uh, tours today. It's going to be Crops, Covers, and Cows at the Minokin Farm, just east of Bismarck, here in Burley County. And one of our featured speakers today is uh, Steve Groff from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And welcome, Steve, appreciate having you here. And uh, we've had you here uh, a few times before in North Dakota, mm -hmm. uh, again, as uh, in the past, a featured speaker. And you've always done a really excellent job for us, so we want you to know how much we appreciate having you here. And uh, today uh, we want to just talk a little bit about uh, kind of some of the work that you've done over the years. And when we think of you, we think of an early, early adopter mm -hmm. on cover crops. Um, because I think it would be safe to say you were in cover crops before they were considered a buzzword mm -hmm. long before. <laughs> And so as an early adopter of cover crops, uh, give us a little bit of information how this kind of yeah. even occurred and kind of sure. when did this all happen yeah. and when did Steve Groff move into covers? And mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Well, first of all, thank you, Jay, for inviting me back again. I've always uh, appreciated seeing what you're doing here and also hearing uh, what you're doing in the various publications and so forth. I always pay attention to what comes out of the Minokin farm. So. Uh, my story would go back to 1982, the year I graduated from high school. Uh, I was uh, dealing with soil erosion issues from rain, from water on my uh, hilly farm in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. And you know, my, my motivation for uh, dealing with uh, soil erosion was I just didn't like having to fix the ditches in order to cross them to harvest my corn. <laughs> I had no concept of soil health or I didn't care about the water quality. You know, we just didn't back in those days. But it was more to be able to fix those gullies so I wouldn't have to fix them before we, uh, we harvested. So that's what got me into no-till. And uh, I, I very quickly saw the benefits then of no-till that I didn't even really know what to expect. And I had been using cover crops whenever it was convenient, mainly just to keep the soil covered over the winter with cereal rye. That was the only cover crop we ever even thought of using. Uh, and, and then it was in 1995 when I first started speaking publicly about my no-till and, uh, and that, that I made a comment at one of, my, uh, one of my talks that I said, I do not know if cover crops really pay after you no-till for five to 10 years. And it was a legitimate question that I asked, and I asked it publicly. And Dr. Ray Wall from University of Maryland was in the audience. He was actually speaking that day. And he came up to me afterwards and said, do you want to do some research? Because he said, I've been asking that question too. Do cover crops pay? And that led to a 12 year run of research on my farm. And it started in 95. In 99, we had a, a very dry year. And uh, we saw on these plots, after four years of cover crops that we got 28 bushels more of corn on that dry year where the cover crops have been planted. That was my epiphany. That was my moment. And ever since that, I've been trying to maximize the value of cover crops. So when I, uh, I listen to you speak, I, I hear some of the um, original resource concerns might have been erosion mm -hmm. uh, in the early 80s. And this then started to evolve for you in terms of a, of a no-till system. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that you emphasized was in 95 when you actually started speaking. Mm -hmm. And I think when you speak to a group, that's a different commitment. Yeah. And, and I think at that point in time, I, I think that commitment is saying, yes, I, I've seen enough of this now that I'm very confident mm -hmm. in moving into it. And so I, I, what I'm hearing you say is uh, the no-till system that now, today, uh, we would think of as minimizing carbon loss. Mm -hmm. And you, you uh, combine that with the cover crop mm -hmm. integration mm -hmm. that allowed a carbon inlet. Right. So when you brought those two together, mm -hmm. what, what were some mm -hmm. of your early thoughts on? Yeah, well, I, uh, 
I was monitoring my soil organic matter and it was starting to creep up in the late 80s, early 90s. But it, uh, it really started to be more steadily increasing when I started incorporating cover crops. But it's not just cover crops. It's crop rotation, crop diversity. And diversity is, is, is beyond uh, just the cash crops. I mean, the soil doesn't know the difference between a cash crop and what we call cover crops, or a weed for that matter. You know, plants that we consider be undesirable. But the point is we as farmers can manage the plants. We need to manage the plants we grow that we get income from. We need to manage the plants that we call cover crops that help build the soil and so forth. So when I started seeing um, the soil organic matter increasing, that was like, okay, this, this is what I kind of expected. Then the next frontier was more, oh, there's a nutrient value here. They store nutrients better. I'd never known this stuff before. Uh, so starting to hear different people talk about it. Um, and and uh, being out here in 2007 in Bismarck at that conference, the first time I was, I was uh, here learning about mixed species, mixed cover crop species. I had, I had thought I was on to something where I was mixing two together, radishes and oats. I thought I'm really on to something here. I show up in North Dakota and you guys had tried like eight or so. I thought, whoa, I got to replicate that at home too. And, and just like it worked here, it's worked at home uh, in, in the mid-Atlantic region. And uh, so looking at the ability for the soil to, to be able to hold more nutri nutrients that we can reduce fertil fertilizers uh, in, our, as, in our cash cropping system has been something that I have really been paying a lot of attention to. And there's a lot of other things too. You know, we talk about weed control uh, and, and, and those issues with, in, the, in the context of using cover crops and diversity and living roots year round. All those basic principles that if you've been listening to these podcasts, I'm sure you heard of repeatedly, but they work worldwide, but they're different in each community. And that's what we need to figure out. Each farmer needs to figure out what works in his farm, not, alone, not just his farm, but his fields. And sometimes it's field by field basis. Uh, I have, I've learned that even on my farm, that there's just certain fields and certain scenarios that you, that you get set up for that you have to make sometimes decisions at the last moment uh, just to... As to, as to what's available, what the opportunities are in front of you. And I would just add, Jay, that the, the thing I see in the future here is this whole system that we created is actually setting us up well for a more healthy and more of a quality of a product. People are talking about nutrient density and uh, you know healthy food and, and all that. I know there's a lot of things to unpack with that, but it's, it's I never started out to, to approach the possibility of growing a more nutrient dense food product that I'm growing for, for humanity, so to speak. But here we are. I think it's an opportunity that's right. We're right in the threshold that we, we want to step across and, and be able to actually market some of the things that we have done here with this whole regenerative agriculture movement. Well, it kind of segues into the next um, conversation here with you. And, and uh, so w listening to you speak starting in 82 and then evolving from there. And, and presently in, in the ag sector, you're, you're quite well known as a, as a um, supporter and speaker in terms of soil health and things mm -hmm. you've done on your own farm, things you've observed in, in working with others, entities uh, and individuals. And so you've, you've kind of become known also in addition to no-till, in addition to the cover crops, and in addition to all these things as, uh, as a kind of putting together the whole soil health arena. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, how did, you know, presently we, we think of you in those terms, but at some pivotal point something probably also occurred in, in the Steve Groff world yeah. that made this happen as well. Because it's a whole nother, oh, yeah. you, you kept adding these is what I'm picking yeah. up from yeah. you. But, but that's kind of a bigger step where you kind of went with more of a systems approach. Right. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that as well and how, how that occurred. And Well, everyone has their journey in life. And mm -hmm. I, I shared with you some of it uh, on the business side. Uh, I saw an opportunity to start a seed business when, when, I, when I helped uh, with, with actually Dr. Ray Wiles' help get what later became the tillage radish. A lot of people have heard of the tillage radish. Mm -hmm. That was actually... Mm -hmm. I like to call my farm the birthplace of the tillage radish because that's where it was essentially created and, and, and that was really helped to be a spark plug for the cover crop movement 
in the past, uh, well, 15, 20 years ago, it really helped to create an awareness of cover crops because the radish was something that grew easily. It was different, it was unique. People could usually see some results rather quickly. And so I started a seed business uh, out of that and that became uh, internationally uh, known and, and selling seeds around the world. And then developed into other cover crop species as well with that. And um, yeah, then just had some, uh, I guess you'd say some, some business challenges in the context of that that uh, I would say I wasn't prepared for. Um, uh, and, and came out of that with uh, a, a lot of, I guess you would say, tough learning experiences. And, but I'm building on that now, what I've learned from that kind of in the business side of it. I really saw myself more as, as an educator. And uh, so, and, and I'm, a, I'm a farmer first. That's, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, but, you know, I do enjoy peop helping people to, uh, to, to be able to help them to go to the next step. I don't care where a person's at. Uh, if they're still moldboard plowing and uh, they've never used a cover crop and they will say, you know, I'd like to try a field that I maybe quit moldboard plowing, I'd like to try a cover crop, I'm all there for them. I'm not going to try to take them to the nth degree of what I think they should be doing this year. I just want to help people move in the right direction at the pace they're comfortable with. And that's kind of my style. Um, so this has led now to a, uh, I have a weekly webinar that I do uh, in a group, a membership group uh, called Cover Crop Innovators that I have weekly webinars that uh, people have to join, sign up for that because it is a private thing and then we have uh, we were, we we're able to talk amongst each other on a Facebook group and answer and ask questions and so forth. That's really, I really enjoy being a connector as well, to connect people that may be able to help another person experience. It's not about me uh, per se. Yeah, I know a few things, but I also know people who may know more than I. And Jay, you and I were talking about salinity issues here earlier on. I don't know a lot about that because I don't deal with it, but you do. and. Uh, so I like to connect people to, to help uh, out with their issues and I, I really am all about seeing uh, agriculture as a whole to be able to move and what we are now calling regenerative agriculture, I'm comfortable with that term, that's where I feel I'm, my home is so to speak. Um, so anything I can do to help people to move in that direction um, is, is helpful. I, I really try to focus here recently more on mindsets because I think that's the, one of the biggest barriers sometimes, that people just aren't, um, aren't thinking the right way. Um, like one of the mindsets I, I talk about is treat your cover crops like your cash crops. If you do that, and that's sure. a mindset, yeah. if you Absolutely. do that, you will be um, stand a much better chance of success. And um, that's just one example there of how right. that works. So. Right. So we're, we're kind of hearing a number of, uh, of uh, different aspects that you brought together over time. As a farmer, as a businessman, as this connector, um, as, a, as a speaker, and, and uh, you, you wear a number of hats and they're all rather integrated together. And so consequently, it kind of begs the question then, um, you know, you're quite well known as an international speaker as well, mm -hmm. and so in, in a number of different countries. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you would consider sharing us with us a little bit about what you've seen on mm -hmm. cover crop adaptation around yeah. the globe a little yeah. bit too, because you would be an excellent person to yeah. ask this question. Yeah, so just to, as a context, I've been to Australia a couple times, I've been to Europe many times, all over Canada and US. I'm going to Argentina, I'm really looking forward to that here in November. Uh, I've never been to South America yet. But you know, any any anyone who's traveled internationally in the I guess the realm of soil health, you you will readily agree that the the, uh, the principles are the same, but the the actual way they go about uh, farming is is sometimes different. I mean, right. I was in South Africa last September, and I saw no one row no-till corn planters designed to be pulled with an oxen. Mm -hmm. where the weight to put it in the ground is the person who is standing on the actual one row planter. And you know, you see that right. and, and uh, yeah, that looks a little different the way they approach. They're looking at, you know, one to two hectares, you know, an acre and a half to, to, to two or three acres only. And so you see that, but those principles are the same, cover crops, no soil disturbance and, and all that stuff. 
And then you, you, what was interesting, I'll just stay with South Africa, is I saw some of the most high-tech type uh, sprayers there. I actually saw a sprayer that was designed to, uh, to spray uh, herbicides and also seed, interseed cover crops in the same pass on the same machine, variable rate, to, hooked up to a prescriptive map. I mean, right now, that's pretty high-tech. So that was at that same right. show. So that kind of gives you an example of... Uh, of some of the dynamics you see worldwide. And no matter where you go, I always see a couple fairly successful farmers are making it work, and then you always hear someone that says, well, I just can't make it work, or I, I've struggled and it doesn't work. And a lot of that does have to do with mindsets um, and how they approach it and who they get, who's their mentor. That's, that's one thing that I actively promote now, and I'll just say to anybody who's listening to this, who is doing what you want to achieve? That is the that's the that's what you need to think about uh, when when you're thinking about choosing a mentor. Who is doing what you want to achieve? So that begs the question: What do you want to achieve? What do you want to accomplish in your farm with what you know? It can be several different things. If you happen to know someone in the neighborhood, that's like as good as it gets. Most farmers are willing to talk about what they do. Most are. Um, now, if it's not someone that's in your neighborhood, for instance, I'll just say um, I have uh, a long-term relationship with Frederick Thomas from France. Yep. I think you know him, Jay. Yes. You've been over there, yep. right? Correct. Uh, he's one of my mentors. Okay, he's half a world away. Um, somewhat similar climate to mine in southeastern Pennsylvania, so we share some of that. But what we share the most is the way we think. And, uh, and, and that's just good. We talk to each other probably once a month. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's what I suggest is really critical. If you want to take it to the next level the fastest, identify someone that you can connect with that's more try, hopefully doing what you want to accomplish. And I think, I think that is one of the things I've learned from some of my international travels that's very helpful to do. Well, I think some of the work you're doing with um, Cover Crop Innovators, uh, your weekly podcast, mm -hmm. and, and just social media in general, is uh, kind of brought up uh, a level of education universally uh, mm -hmm. across the planet. Yeah, and and I think what I'm hearing you say is you probably have witnessed something very similar when you uh, set foot into a different country and you mm -hmm. share uh, what's happening on your farm mm -hmm. and, and your experiences, which mm -hmm. I feel is so invaluable if you're willing to do that. Right. And and I think the then you combine that with the um, the mentor, yeah. uh, who's doing what you're doing type mm -hmm. approach. And then you uh, you realize that maybe that person doesn't have to be right next to me. Mm -hmm. Maybe that person can be a half a world mm -hmm. away from me, mm -hmm. and we can still connect. Right. And and what yeah. I'm what I'm hearing you say is this is kind of uh, something that's uh, brought up this educational level sure. rather, rather universally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll just make a uh, follow up to that, Jay. Um, what I what I've noticed, and and when you think about it, it's pretty obvious. The, the innovative type farmers, the innovative type people, don't need a lot of help, per se. They they intuitively go out, they go to meetings, they get on the internet, wherever. They they are a sponge. They're curious. They're always learning, um, and and uh, most of those uh, those guys don't need a lot of help per se. Now, since cover crops and soil health uh, has kind of become I'm not going to say it's mainstream yet, but it's it's legitimized. You see it in all the farm magazines. Farmers are primed like never before to use cover crops, to use soil health practices, and all that. It's that next wave of farmers who, what they would really like is if you'd hand them a paper with a prescription on how to do soil health. Well, you can't just buy soil health. You can't buy it in a bag or a bottle. You have to manage it. And so that's where this educational component now comes in, like what you're doing here at the Minokan Farm, uh, to actually show people. And they need to see it several times, several years, whatever, uh, to, to give them some pointers, to give them a direction. And uh, you know, when people ask me uh, what, what the cover crops should they grow, if, if I get that question, I will say, I don't know. And I'll give them a blank stare. <laughs> because I don't know. Because there's so many variables, yeah. you know. And, and so... Uh, with this whole education component now, uh, as from my perspective and my experience, I did pioneer uh, a, a seed business because there was a need for it in 2004 when I started that. You couldn't just go buy cover crop seeds. Very, very difficult to find the seeds. 
that problem has been solved. If you want cover crop seeds now, you can get them. Uh, but the educational side of it is still catching up. Uh, I mean, I love to see new names on the programs. I'm seeing new people and new, I'll say, cover crop rock stars starting to emerge. That is awesome. Uh, and, and so that's very encouraging to me. I, that tells me the movement has a future. And there's new ideas. I mean, I used to, you might say, be, you know, felt like I was, you know, ahead of the tip of the spear. And in some ways, I guess I still am. But now I see other people out there. They're doing things like, well, I never thought of that before. You know, how can I incorporate that in my farm? And I, you know, I, I see anybody in education with the soil health movement should have some job security because it's it's the momentum is strong enough now it's going to be around for a while and so this educational component i think is vital right now for where we're at because we need to take that next level of farmers get them comfortable get them competent i like to use that word they need to be confident to grow cover crops like they are confident to grow cash crops doesn't mean you succeed every year and i think that's again it comes back to my thing Treat your cover crops like your cash crops. If you do that in every aspect, you'll you'll do a pretty good job probably making it work. Well, we, I think you really also described why uh, two other uh, individuals that'll be on today's tour are uh, local mm -hmm. North Dakota boys and um, Justin Zaradka and Aaron Steckler. And they both have a good background uh, with uh, covers and livestock. And, and what you just described so well, Steve, is they, they are also young, mm -hmm. moving into this right. whole concept. And I think they both have, they're both farmers. I think they both have a, a great career ahead of them. Mm -hmm. And Justin near Lawton, North Dakota, and Aaron Steckler near St. Anthony, North Dakota. And so, Again, we want to really uh, express our gratitude mm -hmm. for you coming to North Dakota and uh, taking part in Crops, Covers, and Cows, which will be this afternoon uh, at the Minokan Farm. And we can't thank you enough for everything you've done and being a spokesperson for the resource. The Soil Health Podcast is a production of the Minokan Farm. Minokan Farm exists to foster natural resource education and systems approach conservation. This 150-acre demonstration farm, located just east of Bismarck, North Dakota, was established in 2009 and draws people from all over the world. The farm is owned and operated by Burley County Soil Conservation District, which has an office in Bismarck, North Dakota. Additional financial and technical support is provided by the North Dakota Department of Health Water Quality Division, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture.